The program you are about to see is based on a war game developed with the help of military experts and advisors. Its purpose is to inform, not to alarm. You will witness a series of events reported by the evening news on television. A series of events that could lead us to the brink of World War III. At this moment, flying over the United States is a military airborne command plane. It is a communication outpost for the President and Strategic Air Command. It is capable of transmitting orders to U.S. forces across the world during a nuclear confrontation. Its code name is Looking Glass. Good evening, I'm Don Tobin. This is CBN World News Today. A terrorist bomb in Saudi Arabia today took the life of American Ambassador Gabriel Seaton and killed four others at the United States Embassy. For a report on this, the latest in a series of startling developments in the Middle East, we hear from Michael Boyle at the U.S. Embassy in Jeddah. The bomb exploded in a pantry next to the kitchen on the ground level. The blast tore away a whole corner of the building all the way to the roof above the fourth store. Ambassador Seaton was in his third floor of office on the same corner and was apparently killed instantly. Three other officials also died in the attack. Ironically, security at the embassy was tightened only yesterday in response to a wave of violence in the region triggered by America's banking crisis. This is Michael Boyle, CBN News, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Just a few moments ago, the White House issued the following statement. We are appalled by the senseless killing of Ambassador Seaton and three members of the embassy staff. The United States calls on the government of Saudi Arabia to take immediate action to apprehend and punish the terrorists who committed this crime. The statement went on to offer sympathy to Ambassador Seaton's wife and two children and to the relatives and dependents of the other dead Americans. The ambassador's death climaxes several days of turmoil in the Middle East that were ignited by the bank crisis here at home. It's been years since Americans have lived through such an astonishing week. Five days ago, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, forming a debtor's cartel, defaulted on their loans. That caused the failure and collapse of three American banks. Within 24 hours, panic and speculation throughout the country led to the withdrawal of more than three billion dollars. That forced the White House to close the banks, to put a halt to all banking transactions. But Americans have found it hard to be separated from their money, and the bank crisis, now in its fifth day, continues to cause eruptions of violence. Barry McKay reports from New York. This was the scene this morning at the National Mercantile Bank. Local depositors, responding to a rumor that the bank will be open again for normal business, stormed the doors in a futile attempt to be reunited with their money. The National Mercantile was one of three banks that failed because of the South American loan defaults. The patience of these citizens, as well as their cash, is rapidly becoming exhausted. This is Barry McKay, CBN News, New York. In the highly complex arrangements of international finance, the impact of our bank crisis continues to be felt throughout the world, particularly among the oil-producing countries of the Middle East. Soviet-backed guerrillas toppled the government of Oman after it had lost $700 million of its national treasury, which had been invested in an American bank. And now, the turmoil has spread to Saudi Arabia with the bombing of the embassy and the death of our ambassador. To help us make sense of the new political geography in the Middle East, we have senior correspondent Eric Severide in our Washington studios. Eric, how gravely does Washington take this? And what's your own view? How far do you think it can go? It means something that while America rides out the bank crisis with restraint and some patience, the reaction in the Middle East has expressed itself with guns and bombs. As we saw with the Iran-Iraq war, allegiances in that area are highly volatile. 
People in official Washington are, of course, unhappy by these events, but not all that surprised. As for what's your own view, how, how long can that restraint and patience obtain? Well, it's a national policy premise that the Persian Gulf and its oil resources are vital to the Western world, to our allies in Europe and the Pacific. We're not likely to back away from that policy now. But it's a threat of civil war in Saudi Arabia, the biggest, richest, and closest Arab friend of the U.S., that could mean calamity to American interests in that region. Eric Severide, thank you. The chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of the Treasury met with the President earlier today to review the most recent developments in the bank crisis. Here is Dorian Waldorf with the latest from the White House. This afternoon, the White House issued a statement saying the administration will, and I quote, wait and see before planning to issue script to take the place of currency during the bank shutdown. Observers here take that as the first hint that the bank holiday may not last as long as once predicted. This follows closely on the heels of the Treasury Secretary's statement to the press in the last hour that the world cash crisis may soon be easing. This is Dorian Waldorf, CVN News, at the White House. I've just been told that we have Nancy Dickerson at the State Department with a live report. Nancy? Press Paul Secretary Wayne. John J. Bingham. But we've learned from experience that hasty reaction to events still unfolding can impact on the events themselves. The simple fact of the matter is that the Department of State continues to watch these events in the Middle East with what we used to call in the Navy a weather eye on our interests. Now, I'll take questions. John, John. Yes, Ms. Dickerson. In the last week, we've had a leftist coup in Oman, right at the Straits of Hormuz. We've had the Emir of Kuwait assassinated. Nancy, now, is this one question or an editorial? Look, John. The U.S. ambassador. Stay one question, then cue down. Right. Yeah, I don't what understand does all this how mean? the administration can play this thing so low key. I think we better dig into the White House. Yeah. Irene, I want to speak to Dory Waldorf just as soon as possible, please. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Hi, oh, sorry. Mm, it's okay, I didn't have anything better to do. Oh, yeah, this is a lot of laughs. Well, they're letting us sign chits for drinks. Is that right? Mm. Oh, well, in that case, I'll have a double butt. How was your day? Eventful. I gave my report to the president. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's great they can let me have my own room. In that case, I better have another one. This is a CDN news break. The body of Ambassador Gabriel Seaton will be flown back to the United States this evening by military jet. The White House is relaxed tomorrow. The national... So is the National Security Advisor in on this? National Security Advisor's in on everything. Sees all, knows all. Tells nothing. Tells me everything. Hmm? Well, maybe you'll drop a juicy tidbit over dinner. Uh, dinner's off. Sorry. Is it the Middle East, Oman? Now intelligence picked up a couple of problems. We're banging heads trying to get it sorted out. What about later? Do you want to stop by? Yeah, sure. I'll try. The Defense Department announcement just now released says that a United States Central Command contingent landed earlier today in Saudi Arabia. This move, estimated to be the largest United States military operation since the Vietnam War, has taken much of the nation and the world by surprise. This action, the Pentagon said, is a peacekeeping initiative made in response to King Fahd's request for U.S. help after rebellious units of his own army occupied the sacred city of Mecca. CBN's Michael Boyle landed with the U.S. forces. He filed this story earlier from an unidentified location in Saudi Arabia. Claiming national security as the reason, the Defense Department has only now authorized the release of this report nine hours after the landing. 
paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division began landing shortly after dawn, American troops are on the Arabian Peninsula. This is very much a combined operation. The Army, the Air Force, and the Marines all have units here. How many? The answer to that question, at this stage at least, is classified. In 1983, I watched the Grenada invasion from a boat offshore, and I know this is a much larger force. An hour or so ago, we watched the delivery of at least a dozen Lance missiles, and also an unknown number of M110 howitzers. Both weapons are nuclear capable, but no one here is saying much about that. Earlier today, United States Marines landed on the shores of the Red Sea, a few miles south of the city of Jeddah. A scene reminiscent of last year's showdown in Lebanon, but on a much larger scale. As to why all this is happening, Colonel Howard Anderson gave this somewhat understated explanation. I have a prepared statement, gentlemen. United States combat forces, at the invitation of the government of Saudi Arabia, will take and hold defensive positions at agreed upon locations. The forces will assist in re-establishing public order and deterring aggression against the people of Saudi Arabia. That's it. Supplying these troops with everything from spare parts to letters from home is not going to be an easy operation. This is Michael Boyle, CVN News, somewhere in Saudi Arabia. For an evaluation of this extraordinary military intervention, we have standing by Paul Warnke, a former Assistant Secretary of Defense, and also the U.S. Chief Negotiator on the SALT-1 Treaty. Mr. Warnke, how long is it since the world saw an American military intervention of this magnitude? Well, I would say that it's really comparable to the Vietnam commitment, but it's happening overnight. So it's the major infusion of American military strength, and we have not seen anything like it since World War II. Well, but can this be seen by the Soviet Union as anything other than a provocative act? It should not be seen as provocative by the Soviet Union. We've told them repeatedly, during the Carter administration, for example, that in the event of trouble in the Gulf that interfered with the flow of oil, we would commit American military forces. We have a stake in the stability of the area, and that preservation of stability in the area does not threaten the vital interests of the Soviet Union. Paul Warnke, thank you once again. Tonight, a United States command contingent watched over a troubled Saudi Arabia following the White House directive to help establish public order and deter aggression. But more importantly, they're guaranteeing the free flow of oil from the Saudi refineries and ensuring that giant tankers will be able to make their way through the Persian Gulf unmolested. It's really been appalling around here today. Yeah, me too. Listen, Anne, I'm preparing you. I don't think it's going to work going to Monhegan this weekend, not for me. But don't tell the kids. I want you all there. No, I've seen it worse. But I can't remember it being quite so crazy. Not since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, me too. Let's finish this at home, hmm? of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia yesterday has met with a storm of criticism both at home and abroad. We'll have reports from Washington, London, and West Germany. Good evening. I'm Don Tobin. This is CVN World News Today. The official Soviet news agency TASS today characterized the American deployment of troops in Saudi Arabia as a grave act of provocation against the Saudi people and a blatantly imperialist action to prop up the corrupt puppet government of King Fahd, unquote. In contrast, the White House has been relatively quiet today. No visitors, no press announcements, no sign of the president or his staff. But not far away, it was quite a different story, as Dorian Waldorf reports. 
According to the standards set by the peace movement during the Vietnam War, this was hardly a demonstration at all. But as one of the organizers here reminded me, that movement began small also and had a decade to build up steam. They're going to tell us about dominoes and all of that stuff, but this time the American people aren't going to buy it. I lost a son in Lebanon. There hasn't been anybody yet who's been able to tell me what he died for. This is Dorian Waldorf, CBN News, Washington. For a look at reaction outside the country from American allies, we go to Gordon Scott in London. The size of the crowd surprised even the organizers of Britain's campaign for nuclear disarmament. In contrast to many demonstrations over the years in this venerable square, the mood today was grim, grave, sober. If statements made today are anything to go on, the Americans, who have traditionally thought of the English as their strongest ally, will have to look elsewhere for the support they seek for their recent activities in the Middle East. This is Gordon Scott, CBN News, London. Reaction of the Russians is a question that's been on everyone's mind. Standing by in Washington, we have CBN News senior correspondent Eric Severide and Georgia Congressman Newt Gingrich, first Congressman Gingrich. There's been a lot of controversy, Congressman, as to whether the Rapid Deployment Force was an appropriate response to this turmoil in the Middle East. What's your view? Don, this is the biggest crisis to face the Western Alliance since either the Bay of Pigs or the blockade of Berlin. We see radical governments taking over in the Middle East. We see a threat to the very lifeline for Japan and Western Europe. We have our friends, people who've been with us, asking for our help. And I think that we in America have to make the decision. If we're going to remain a world power, if we're going to hold together the Western alliance, we have to be capable of staying in places that are in trouble in order to preserve that alliance when it's under pressure. Well, isn't it, isn't it risky, though? Couldn't it be seen by the Soviet Union as a provocative act? From the Soviet standpoint, they would love to have the oil fields. There is a two or three hundred year history of the Russians back through the czars trying to seize this part of the world. For two centuries, the British stopped them. We are now in the unenviable but real position that it's either the Americans there protecting freedom and helping the Western Europeans and the Japanese and keeping the free world alive, or in fact, the Soviets will take the fields. Congressman Gingrich, thanks very much. We go now to CBN News senior correspondent Eric Severide. Do you think that the Russians are going to be tempted by this reduction of NATO forces in Western Europe? Don, in my own opinion, no. Not in Europe for the simple reason that any move on their part would bring us solidly back into that region. Well, do you think that the Kremlin feels its hand is being forced by these events? Who knows? But the ante has been upped, and now it's their turn. Eric Severide, thank you. Meanwhile, Far from the growing debate over this nation's course, American soldiers keep the vigil in a distant desert and no doubt wonder where it all will end. This has been CVN World News Today. I'm Don Tobin. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, I'm Don Tobin. The Persian Gulf is the center of turmoil again today as the Soviet-backed government of Oman has imposed a toll on all oil ships entering the Strait of Hormuz. This toll has effectively created an economic blockade with giant oil tankers waiting at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, uncertain what to do next. Mick Boyle has a report. Those empty tankers out there are waiting to pay $10,000 apiece for the privilege of passing through the Strait of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf. Oman's new governing council announced the toll midnight last night. Omani patrol boats have been out all day intercepting tankers and escorting them here. Western diplomats are already calling the toll a Soviet-engineered retaliation against the United States for sending troops into Saudi Arabia. Reaction in Washington was swift. In harsh language that recalled the darkest days of the American-Soviet relationship, the administration accused the Soviet Union of interfering with the right of free passage of ships entering the Persian Gulf. Nancy Dickerson has a report from the State Department. Mr. Ambassador, the Soviet ambassador refused to comment on a letter given to him by Dean Craig, Assistant Secretary for Eastern European Affairs. The letter, signed by the Secretary of State, flatly declares that the United States will not tolerate 
any limitations on the right of ships and its merchant fleet to enter and leave the Persian Gulf. The letter leaves unanswered the gut issue. What is the administration prepared to do to back up its tough language? Two things are certain. One is that the administration is holding Russia directly responsible for actions taken by the new government in Oman. The other is that Soviet-American relations are bad and getting worse by the moment. If the Soviets were tongue-tied in Washington, they made up for it in Moscow with a series of sharply worded denials and attacks. Barbara Levin has this report. The Soviet Union officially denied today that it's behind the tanker toll in the Persian Gulf. In a series of speeches at the Presidium, the Soviets accused the United States of upsetting the balance in the region by what it called America's incursion into Saudi Arabia. Analysts here see the reference as the offer of a trade. Get your forces out of Saudi Arabia and Oman will lift the toll. This is Barbara Levin, CBN News, Moscow. Whether the United States government will consider this Soviet statement to be an offer to trade is an interesting question. For an analysis, we go to our former ambassador to NATO, Robert Ellsworth. Ambassador Ellsworth, what about it? The Omanis have put this $10,000 toll on tankers going into the strait. Is that important? Is it strategically consequential? And what about your former colleagues and allies in NATO? How are they going to feel? Uh, on this point, my own view, and I'm sure that of uh, the uh, West Europeans, particularly the French, Germans, and British, is that it could be serious, but that it's not serious enough to justify any kind of precipitate action. Why don't we just swallow the toll? Oh, I think that would be a mistake. I think that that would, that would be caving in at the very beginning uh, of the test of wills and would, in fact, have established the Soviets uh, to a, a, to a major degree with a position of equality of control with regard to the Gulf that neither we nor the Europeans nor the Japanese would be ready to concede yet. Ambassador Ellsworth, thank you. There's an old colleague of ours standing by in Boston who spent many an hour face to face with the Russians across the table and many another hour intensively examining how they think and how they act. He's Professor Lincoln Bloomfield of MIT and he has served both in the State Department and the National Security Council. Link. How do the Russians arrive at their security, at their uh, foreign policy? What are they doing over there, anyway? I wish we knew, Don. Um, I go by a few basic principles. One is that uh, the Soviet leaders resemble a man going down a hotel corridor and trying all the locked doors. Uh, if one of them is open, watch out. Uh, if they're all locked, they're very cautious. How many open doors are they going to find in that hotel? Which is another way of saying, how far is this thing going to go? They must be sitting there calculating right now uh, what are the people in the Situation Room in the White House planning? Uh, what kind of military deployments might the U.S. make? I think there are a lot of uncertainties and frankly, it's a dangerous situation. Lincoln Bloomfield in Boston. Just outside the Strait of Hormuz, giant tankers wait to load on oil for Japan and for our Western allies. However, the Omani toll has effectively stopped all traffic. And the consensus of world energy experts is that this impasse has to come to an end. All right, Dorian, off the record. The White House isn't geared to instantaneous crisis. Great. Here are the Russians and us facing off with each other. Nuclear warheads aimed at each other, and the White House isn't here. Worry about geared? nuclear warheads. That's not the problem. Well, well, the system's overloaded. Too many hot spots. I always told you the White House organization is archaic. Yeah, you tell me a lot of things, Dory. One of your greatest charms is how you so awkwardly try to change the subject. <sighs> well, there goes our romantic little dinner. Things you sacrifice for your country. Hmm? Is the president bunkering in? Not exactly. Why doesn't he level with us? There's damn little to level about. I wish I could believe you. The president is doing, he's just not talking right now. I can hardly wait until you're unemployed. It's going to be quite an adjustment. How so? Once you're out of the White House, you can start telling the truth again. Hmm?
Jesus. We got a war on. Listening, go ahead. You got it. Master control. Interrupt. And your code. Thank you. This is a CBN News Alert. We interrupt our scheduled program to bring you the following news bulletin. The Associated Press reports that American warplanes fought a pre-dawn battle over Saudi Arabia with unidentified fighter planes. One U.S. AWACS reconnaissance aircraft was shot down and fell into the Persian Gulf. The fate of the crew is not known. F-18 fighters attached to the United States Central Command Force in Saudi Arabia engaged the five intruding aircraft after their approach was reported by the reconnaissance plane, which was then shot down. Two of the attacking planes, believed to be from either Iran or Kuwait, were hit and apparently destroyed. The apparent target of the attack was the oil refinery at Ras Tanura, where fires were started. Stay tuned to CBN News as more information becomes available. Americans were shocked today and angered at the death of four crewmen of a U.S. AWACS aircraft shot down over the Persian Gulf. The air battle took place in Saudi Arabia near the oil refinery at Ras Tanura. Earlier today, the Pentagon released the names of the dead airmen. Saudi naval units will assist U.S. Navy divers in an attempt to recover the bodies. The dead are Major Alan Langhorn of San Diego, California, Captain Homer F. Loomis, Raymondville, Texas, Captain Lyle M. Gachel, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Second Lieutenant Lawrence R. Smooth, Fort Smith, Arkansas. In San Diego, Matsu Yamada is with the parents of the dead pilot. They are Angela and John Langhorn. At 7 o'clock this morning, a telegram from the Defense Department brought Mr. and Mrs. Langhorn the news that their son, Alan, lost his life yesterday. The AWACS aircraft Alan was piloting was shot down over the Persian Gulf. My son, you always told me, Mom, I know what I'm doing and I'm good at it. And I don't want you to worry because nothing's going to happen to me. I'm just so proud of him. In Washington, a State Department source who asked not to be identified said that the raid was probably in retaliation against Saudi Arabia for inviting U.S. combat forces into the region. In Congress, the debate continues to heat up as Middle East tensions dominate the business of the nation's lawmakers. Senator Eugene McCarthy is standing by in his office in Washington. Senator, as you know, we've heard that this is the biggest American commitment overseas in military power since Vietnam. And you've seen how divisive it's being in the Congress. If CBN News were to invest you with the leadership of the nation tonight, where would you take us from now on? My caution to the administration would be that they ought to proceed very slowly uh, before either uh, committing the military power they have in the area or in any way escalating the, uh, the confrontation, especially with the Russians in that area. Well, do you think that we should just sit still for this Omani blockade? and try to deal with it diplomatically before we make any kind of military response particularly to that? I think that we have to go very slowly on this matter. The, the Russians have uh, a kind of, I suppose you say, a chip on their shoulders or a, I would think a disposition to retaliate since we interfered with their ships on the high seas at the time of the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, that was the beginning, I think, of the, of the build-up of the Russian Navy. Are you predicting that there may be a naval response to this blockade in the Well, Strait? I think it would have to come from the Navy. It's a question of what kind of naval response we get. If it were limited to surface ships without aircraft, I think it might uh, quite easily be contained. If we go beyond that to the use of, uh, of aircraft off carriers, then I think uh, serious trouble could develop very quickly. Senator McCarthy, thank you very much. There are now 21 tankers waiting to enter the Strait of Hormuz. Nine more than yesterday. 
One tanker captain has threatened to ignore the toll and just sail his ship through the blockade. The Omanis have responded with patrol boats armed with 20 millimeter cannons. And the question tonight, will the Omanis fire on such an unarmed vessel? And will the United States have to implement a naval action to clear the blockade? Whatever the answers, they'll have to be accomplished quickly as the oil reserves for some of our allies begin to shrink. American warships are steaming tonight towards a possible showdown at the entrance to the Persian Gulf. This action was announced in a statement issued only moments ago by Presidential Press Secretary James Otis. The United States Naval Carrier Nimitz and an attendant battle group of cruisers, frigates, and submarines have been ordered to proceed to the Persian Gulf. The group will make certain that American merchant vessels are not hindered in their use of international sea lanes. The President will address the nation at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this evening. We have some pictures of the battle group and the weapons, the kind of military power that we're presenting. The heart of this task force is the U.S. naval carrier Nimitz and her complement of warplanes. The carrier is surrounded by a protective screen of eight frigates and cruisers, and as further security, an unknown number of hunter-killer submarines will sweep the seas ahead of the task force. Most of the ships and planes of this formidable task force are equipped with nuclear weapons, cruise missiles, torpedoes, depth charges, mostly low kiloton yield, but still much larger than the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because of the gravity of events in the Middle East, we are not going to report other news from around the country and the world tonight so that we can concentrate on this rapidly expanding crisis, paying particular attention to the most recent decision by the president. Let's go right away for an analysis to Washington and CBN News senior correspondent Eric Severide. Don, what we are witnessing, quite simply, is a serious escalation of military actions and reactions on both sides. Well, now, what do you think will the Russians do? How will they read our latest move? Well, our stated intention is to create a strong presence in the area in the hopes that the sea lanes will be opened without the use of force. That has not always worked for the U.S. and the Soviets know it. Whether they respond militarily and to what degree is uncertain, but they've got to feel threatened. With this awesome array of technology lined up on both sides in the Gulf, where does that leave us, Eric? In something of a no-man's land. We hope both sides are talking to each other. We assume they're being very, very careful. We hope neither side misreads a signal, misunderstands an intention, or perceives this rattling of sabers as an act of aggression. But here we are, going eyeball to eyeball on the Strait of Hormuz. It's going to take some very fancy footwork for both sides to get up and walk away from this. Eric, thank you very much. A little over two hours from now, at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the President will address the nation from the White House. CBN News will be there to provide live coverage. Phone number is 453 2188, and we want to hear from you. Hello, you're on the air. Hi, uh, yeah, look, I don't know about you, Jerry, but when do the two leaders of the superpowers have the right to flirt with the extinction of the species, huh? Well, is this a general complaint, or do you have a real question? No, I would like to, to hear. So, do I drive or what? No, I gotta get back. Tell me why the hell we're sitting in a dark car in the Jefferson Memorial at 8, 18 p.m.? Feels like we're in a bad detective movie or something. Yeah, it's real simple. I'm breaking the rules. We're not supposed to talk to the press. One leak to CVN and uh, they point the finger right at me. Yeah, it's just because we're seeing each other. Don't they realize how many White House leaks there are? Yeah. But they know I'm on the outs on this one. Who's after you? Grumman. 
intelligence blew it on Oman. He's been ripping ever since. So, is this how we're going to see each other from now on? Story you gotta get out. Satellite photograph crossed my desk tonight, the border between Russia and Iran. Two days ago, the whole area was jamming with activity. I mean, trucks, tanks, mobile rocket launchers all around Ashgabat. Today, tonight, the new photos. Everything's gone. Zero. Everybody's out of there. Dory, it could be a signal. From the Russians? Yes, yes. Maybe they're saying, pull back. We did. Well, the president, has he seen this picture? Everybody's seen it all up and down the line. What does that mean? Does that mean they think it's important? I don't know. I don't think they have time to think anymore. Signal to noise ratio and there's horrendous. Are you sure you want to do this, Bob? I don't have a choice. Here are the copies. One picture before, one after. An expert can see it real easy. Gallery's going to want confirmation. Well, tell them a source close to the president. Two sources. Hey, don't get caught up in your rules and all hell's gonna break loose. That's hot stuff, Dory, and it should be on the air in half an hour. Pop! Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, our country is faced today with a serious challenge. We have been asked, as a people, to make a decision so important that how the world evolves, the course it takes for the next century, will almost surely depend on what we decide. As your president, and with the valued counsel of the leaders of the Congress, the National Security Council, and the members of my cabinet, I have made that decision. My decision is to make it absolutely clear to those who would impose unreasonable and crippling restrictions on vital commerce that such restrictions are unacceptable. To make a decision which would send a signal that is one whit less clear, less determined, would be to abdicate America's responsibilities to the free world. To give substance to this decision, I have ordered the Navy to take whatever steps are necessary to ensure that the Persian Gulf is open to shipping. Furthermore, I have instructed the Selective Service Board to induct into the armed services all registrants who have reached their 20th birthday. Oh, shit. That's my son. We seek no test of arms. Our commitment to peace is matched only by our resolve that no nation, great or small, may hold other nations hostage to its greed for wealth or power. God bless you, and good night. Okay, Don, tell us all about it. Well, the key is that the Navy can take whatever steps necessary. Huh. Do you think that means that they've given the task force commander the right to make strategic decisions, start a war? Let's find out what it does mean, Frank. Well, what I wish we could do is get through to someone close to the president and persuade them that we have got to get a man on board one of those ships in the task force. Yeah. Uh -huh. Talk to Jim Otis at White House. Yeah. You might remind him that the Brits had news people with their feet in the fall clubs. And say if there's going to be any Grenada-style censorship, he won't find the media quite so complacent this time. Right on. Okay, let's take this. We've got a Waldorf piece coming in from Washington. Irene, and try and get a hold of uh, Jim Otis at the White House press office. And if not... I'll talk to Mr. Dunstetter and Mr. Grauman. I'll be at Studio 6 Control. Okay. Are they ready? Good. 
So, we all set? Uh, Washington, check your uh, phasing. She... She's Make ready? Sure. Yeah, we're rolling. It's rolling. Okay. <laughs> all right. Cue, Dory. Washington, you've got it. In these critical days, the intelligence agencies are working around the clock in a desperate effort to give the country's political and military leaders the information they need to make crucial decisions. Literally thousands of bits and pieces of information are gathered daily. Every one of them has to be studied as a possible clue to Soviet intentions. For instance, there's the unconfirmed report that Chinese in large numbers are crossing the border into Russia. What does it mean? Are they volunteers on their way to join forces with the Russians? Are they simply peasants fleeing crop failures in this northern is a Sinkian bloody province? Mini documentary? No one knows for sure. But it is one more cause for alarm, one more demand on available energy. Or there is this satellite photograph that was taken yesterday. This is the border between the Soviet Union and Iran. In this picture, taken two days ago, the objects indicated are military vehicles and weapons on the Russian side of the border. In this photo, taken last night and just released to CVN News, there is no visual evidence of any military activity whatsoever. The border is clear. Why? Is Moscow signaling to Washington, we pulled back, now you do the same? Standby videotape, we're coming to the end of the report. Irene, I want to speak to Dory just as soon as she's through. On the answer to that question, and others like it, may depend decisions that could lead to war or peace. This is Dorian Waldorf, CVN News, Washington. This stuff is fantastic. I mean, this is great stuff. You get it? Hit the floor, gentlemen. I hope they listen. Dory. Dory, who else has seen those photos? No, 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 no. I mean, the network, cable. Okay, FB, put those uh, photos up again. All right. Now, this is really classified stuff. How'd you get your hands okay, on it? Okay, splitting. Usually reliable White House, so... Dory, we're, we're going to need another source. Now, c confirmation. Somebody closer to the president. Yeah, I know exactly how you feel, Dory. Just a minute. Dorian, this is Don. Yes, of course I understand. But you understand that we've got policy on a story like this. Now, you get that confirmation, okay? Dory, honey, I'm sorry. Look. Bye. That is one unhappy moment. Marvin, when we've got a story that could change the course of a war, then... It could we... stop a war. All right, either way. We better make damn sure that we've got another source that doesn't just happen to be the reporter's boyfriend. Don, you picked a hell of a time to stand on policy. does not run without confirmation. Listen, if you can break away, a very good source wants to back me up. You got a meeting. Okay, anytime. Parking garage, Lafont Plaza, on the lower deck, park near the ticket booth. Look for a gray BMW. Six o'clock sharp, got it. Wait a minute, that doesn't leave me any... What's Waldorf doing about those satellite photographs? She's waiting for confirmation. It's another deep throat in a parking garage. We won't know till six. Which, uh... kind of puts us in the squisher. Stay tuned for the 7 o'clock news. Coming up in just 30 seconds, right after the sports highlights. In Philadelphia, Mark Thurman defeats the hot Philadelphia offense with a three-hitter and pitch San Diego Padres to a three victory over the Philly. In New York, Keith Hernandez is double his ninth inning score to pinch hitter. Excuse me, that's a dollar, please. 
Soviet submarines are believed to be headed tonight towards the Persian Gulf in a possible confrontation with American warships. Good evening. This is CBN World News. Today, Don Tobin reporting. CBN's Michael Boyle and a camera crew were flown early today to the aircraft carrier Nimitz, power center of the task force in the Indian Ocean, steaming towards the Persian Gulf. Mick filed this report earlier today. an F-18 hornet off the deck of the Nimitz. Many of this great ship's planes are already in the air searching for a flotilla of Russian submarines. The subs, believed to be of the Typhoon class, the Soviet Navy's largest, were spotted last Tuesday off the Strait of Malacca, far from their home base in Vietnam. Their assumed destination, the troubled waters of the Strait of Hormuz. Planes have been shuttling on and off the deck of the Nimitz since well before our arrival this morning in hopes of locating the submarines. It is thought that the Russian subs are nuclear powered and are armed with torpedoes that can use either conventional or nuclear warheads. Meanwhile, this giant carrier and its protective shield of escort vessels steam north at top cruising speed toward the Persian Gulf. At this speed, the entrance to the Strait of Hormuz is less than two days away. This is Michael Boyle for CVN News, aboard the aircraft carrier Nimitz. Gordon Scott in London now has a report on the latest Soviet response. Units of the Russian home fleet sailed out of the Black Sea and into the Aegean today. Admiralty sources in London speculated that the ships would reinforce Russian vessels already in the Mediterranean, possibly with a view to keeping the Americans' Sixth Fleet from the Persian Gulf. Thirty-five years of Cold War threatening to turn hot is failing, at least so far, to bring Americans closer together. If anything, the divisions, the fractures in the body politic grew wider today. While young men lined up at induction centers, other citizens protested. If the crowd outside this induction center is any indication, there'll be no lack of military manpower to respond to the fast-moving events in the Middle East. How happy they are to be here? is yet another question. As always, it depends on who you ask. I'll do what I have to do, that's all. It's not like uh, patriotism or anything. It's more like a job. You enlisted? Why? I don't want to see us get pushed around anymore. We haven't uh, won a war since 1945. I think we got a real chance of winning this one. I want to be part of it. All right. I will support and defend the Constitution. Whatever kind of war it might be, if indeed it is a war, many of these young men will be in it, like it or not, marching to the same drummer for the first time in their lives. Barry McKay, CBN News, Induction Center. Chicago, Washington, Boston, Dallas, and 24 other major American cities, at last count, have had protest demonstrations of one form or another. The largest was here in New York. Thousands of citizens gathered in front of the UN and then marched up Fifth Avenue past St. Patrick's Cathedral. The most violent was in Berkeley, California, where 13 people were taken to hospital and over 40 arrested. For the latest developments in the Soviet Union, we go now to Barbara Levin in Moscow. The Soviet Union's defense ministry today called up six classes of reservists. Military leaves were canceled in the same order. All servicemen and women were told to report to their units. In addition, according to the just-released task report, Soviet Chief of Staff Marshal Nikolai Vyogarkov was quoted as saying the United States has totally ignored his country's offerings of conciliation. He went on to say the United States government has continued to pursue its goals of expansionism and domination in the Middle East. What conciliation? What the hell are they talking about? Pull back. Of its belligerency. You mean during the United States? Barkov called on all photograph? members of Russia's armed forces to do their duty in defense of the motherland. This is Barbara Levin, CBN News, Moscow. God Almighty. And no, I'm not blaming myself. CBN News can't put stuff like that on the air without confirmation. You know that. Besides, Bob Ellsworth pointed out that those troops disappearing could just as well mean they've been sent into action, for God's sake. 
Yes, I admit Dory did a great job. She'd just get another source besides that White House boyfriend of hers. What? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. I mean, at this stage in our life together, we're not going to start kidding each other, are we? No. No, if I thought that, I'd come home or get you down here. Yeah, newsman, yeah, yeah, newsman, right. Yes, I do, Ann. Yes. Yes, Ann. Okay, hon. Night. I'm Don Tobin in New York for CBN News. In order to bring you the latest information as it emerges from the crisis in the Middle East, CBN News will now remain on the air until further notice. Broadcasting 24 hours a day is a big job, and if we seem to trip over our feet from time to time, we're going to ask you in advance to bear with us. For an analysis of the situation as of this moment, we're going now to Washington and Eric Severide, senior correspondent for CBN News. Eric, do we know any more than we did about how serious this is getting? Well, it's serious, all right, very serious. It's perhaps not as panic-provoking as the Cuban Missile Crisis. The stakes are just as high for both sides, and this is a far more complicated crisis than the one of 62. It has all the earmarks of a showdown, though. Well, Don, it's difficult to second-guess what orders those naval commanders are operating under on either side. We may well be operating on the premise that our much larger, more visible naval strength in the area will be sufficient as a deterrent to the Soviets. On the other hand, they have enormous numbers of land-based missiles within easy range of some very large targets. I'm afraid I can't escape the analogy of a chess match. We can only hope that with any luck and common sense, there will simply be maneuvering with no trading of pieces. Otherwise, in a direct confrontation, it will be difficult for either side to accept a stalemate. So what has to be avoided at all costs, is direct military confrontation. Eric Severide, thank you. For further details on this and other developments, we have a report now from Michael Boyle aboard the aircraft carrier Nimitz. Less than an hour ago, two S-3 Viking planes returned to the deck of the Nimitz, their mission accomplished. They had located unidentified submarines believed to be Russian. Calculations have been made on the speed and direction of the unidentified submarines. Assuming they're correct, they will enter the Gulf of Oman a few hours in advance of the arrival of this task force. If the unidentified submarines are Russian, just what do they have in mind? For CBN News, this is Michael Boyle on the aircraft carrier Nimitz. The Center for Defense Information in Washington is an organization that monitors our defense policy and spending from a completely independent point of view. Its director is Rear Admiral Jean Larocque, United States Navy retired, Admiral Larock has himself commanded a nuclear missile carrying cruiser. Admiral Larock, we now know that there are two battle groups plowing through the Indian Ocean towards a convergence point somewhere in the Gulf of Oman. A Soviet group of attack submarines and our own Nimitz with her escort screen. What do you think is in the minds of the commanders of those two battle groups as they converge on each other? Well, I think very simply in the minds of uh, the U.S. commander and the Soviet commander, they are thinking in terms of nuclear war. The Soviets and the U.S. both have been making plans, practicing, training, and arming for nuclear war. Our main battery in both the United States Navy and the Soviet Navy at sea are nuclear weapons. And if you have Soviet submarines, as apparently is happening, converging with our aircraft carriers, it's just a question of which side uses nuclear weapons first. I know that from my own experience that I would not hesitate one minute to use nuclear weapons when confronted with Soviet submarines because I'm totally aware that the Soviets have nuclear weapons that they can fire at our carrier battle group. So it's just a question of which side uses them first. Any war with the Soviet Union will be a nuclear war. Admiral Iraq, thank you very much. We have Nancy Dickerson sitting in on a news briefing at the State Department, and we're going to... 
This has just come in on the UP wire from Washington. The government today has ordered the shutdown of the nation's nuclear fuel power plants. The spokesman for the nuclear regulatory body said that the closings are being ordered as a precautionary measure. We'll bring you more on that. Now we go to Nancy Dickerson at the State Department. Are we having that briefing from this? State Department spokesman John J. Bingham has told us that he has two announcements. <coughs> the, uh, the governments of Egypt and the Sudan have made a joint offer to mediate between, uh, that is, they made the offer to Saudi Arabia, Oman, and to the United States. The offer is being studied. Uh, something's wrong here. Uh, Ray, pull back. Pull back. Uh, Ray to go to Don Tobin. No, wait a minute. I think yeah, go, go back in. Oh, all right. Zoom, zoom in. Zoom in. Due to unusual demands being placed on departmental officials, daily briefings for the news media are suspended until further notice. Ah, right. Right on the phone. Yeah, 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 yeah. See what you can find out. Yes, yes, Nancy, we have you. Well, John, as you can see, John J. Bingham has left without taking any questions. It's highly unusual. Of course, the one question left on everybody's mind is, what is this crisis all about? Oman's toll charge, Persian Gulf oil, Soviet troops in the Iranian border? I think the only conclusion we can draw is that the people who are making the tough decisions here in Washington are really under tremendous pressure. I've never seen it like this. It's almost as if official Washington has gone into the bunker. Now all we can do is wait and see what happens next and who, if anyone, is going to tell us when it does. This is Nancy Dickerson at the State Department. To help us understand what must be going on in the heart of the White House, former NATO Ambassador Robert Ellsworth is standing by again tonight from his own office. Ambassador Ellsworth, it's clear that the lights are burning pretty late in the Situation Room right now and that the pressure on all those people in there must be terrific. Do they have the capacity to be coherent and well-informed and well-directed as they try to make those decisions? Of course, I hope they are and I believe they are, but the uh, White House staff responsible for these matters in recent years has been uh, rather weak. Uh, do you mean, sir, at the level of the uh, National Security Advisor? I do, and, uh, and of his staff. That's distressing, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Standing by in his office in Boston is a man who has guided this news organization through the intricacies of more than a dozen world crises over the last few years. He's Lincoln Bloomfield of MIT. Link, do you think Robert Ellsworth is right? Don, I think Ambassador Ellsworth is right to be worried. Uh, I'm worried. Um, right now, the president is in control of our system. Our billions of dollars are spent, so the president can control and communicate with all of our nuclear forces. But uh, as things uh, develop in a crisis, uh, release authority goes further down the line, and I think uh, Bob Ellsworth has a very... Link, Link, excuse me, I've got to interrupt you. Uh, I've just been advised from the control room that there's a story coming in that takes us over to Washington. Don't go away, I'll get back to you. Just moments ago, Dawn, our cameras caught this remarkable and rather frightening scene just outside the White House. There was no word at first what was wrong, but it soon became apparent to us that something inside the White House was very wrong, judging by the amount of activity here. But just now, it has been confirmed to us, Defense Secretary Uliano, 53, has died. I repeat, the Defense Secretary is dead. Perhaps from a heart attack, although they're not saying for sure. There were, they say, strenuous efforts to revive him by paramedics, but to no avail. This is Dorian Waldorf at the White House. You know, Defense Secretary Uliano had the respect of the executive branch of the Pentagon and a little bit reluctantly perhaps from us in the news media. He was a straightforward tough guy, he did his homework, he was a vigorous man and it's appalling to think of that chap that we've been seeing on television only a few hours before dead of a heart attack in the situation room. 
Link, you knew uh, Secretary Uliano, and I guess you're just as shocked as I am. Is it conceivable that the pressures of crisis management in that situation room could trigger off a heart attack? Well, I'm just appalled at this news. He was, if there's any time we need solid, uh, prudent, sensible people in, in the situation room, it's right now. Uh, of course, the tension, the pressure there uh, is appalling. It's a crisis system. It's a man-eater. It's a person-eater. It's not possible to count on completely normal behavior. I remember in my own service one uh, very high-ranking government official coming out of a crisis meeting and throwing up in a wastebasket from tension. Another one being rushed to a hospital in the middle of another Middle East war. We, th we spend billions on machinery for, for crisis management, but what is inside people's heads is the same old equipment. And I think this is a terrible problem. They've been coming since dawn. Nobody told them to. There have been no announcements, no leaflets. As far as I've been able to find out, this is completely spontaneous. Some of them leave after a few minutes of silence. Others stay. The quiet was broken only a few moments ago by a young couple tolling the ancient bell mounted near the Hiroshima monument. With the arrival of monks beating their prayer drums, the atmosphere has been transformed into a ceremonial rite. One couple traveled all night from their farm 300 miles to the north. I asked them why they came. The only explanation they could give me was that something told them this was where they should be today. This is Marty Schindler, CBN News, Hiroshima, Japan. It seems incredible. That uh, it was only 12 days ago that the default of Chile and Argentina and Brazil caused this crisis. Demonstrations in Japan and many other countries throughout the world are a clear response to a drama being played out between the United States and the Soviet Union. At center stage in this grave conflict is the U.S. battle fleet. And we have a report from Michael Bo... Is that... Yes. We're going live now to Michael Boyle on the aircraft carrier Nimitz in the Gulf of Oman. Dawn a short time ago, the Nimitz press liaison informed us that we are now within 10 miles of that area, now claimed by Oman as its territorial waters in the Strait of Hormuz. The flight deck of the Nimitz has seen a flurry of activity. Fighter jets taking off to fly over the Strait, inspect Omani gunboat positions, and then return. Two things to remember. First, this task force the Nimitz and an untold number of cruisers, frigates, and subchasers is still being dogged by an invisible flotilla of Russian submarines. Second, the Nimitz continues full speed ahead into the Strait of Hormuz. Make a question, what exactly is the mission besides guaranteeing passage through the Strait? Well, they're still sticking to the official version. If they have any other orders, they're not saying anything about it. What about firepower? Can you confirm that we're nuclear capable out there? Dawn, we've known for years now that many of these ships and planes are dual capable. There's no reason to suspect that that's changed for this operation. But officially, there's no answer to that question. All right, Mick, we'll stay close in touch. Uh, right now, Dorian Waldorf is standing by at the White House with a report. Dorian? It was an angry crowd that gathered here today. Presidential security personnel quickly called in Washington police, requesting that the park and the streets immediately surrounding the White House be cleared. The mood of the demonstrators was one of frustration, which rapidly exploded into violence as the police went into action. Tempers flared on both sides, and for a short time, the situation threatened to become extremely dangerous. However, within an hour, the worst was over. The police had secured the area, but at the cost of many bruised bodies and more than a few arrests. CBN News has just received information that a ship, apparently a super tanker, has exploded and is now on fire in the Strait of Hormuz. There's no confirmation 
that the explosion was caused by an aggressive act. As soon as we're able, we'll bring you more information from Mick Boyle on the Nimitz. Repeating, a giant super tanker has exploded in the Strait of Hormuz and appears to be heavily damaged. Yep. Yep. Okay, we have that report now from Michael Boyle. Daylight has revealed the terrible damage done to a Dutch oil tanker, the Erstig. In an apparent attempt to run the blockade under cover of darkness, the Erstig was fired on by an Omani gunboat. The explosion, which ripped open the hull of the Dutch tanker, has caused a tremendous fire, sending black smoke hundreds of feet into the air. There are still no official estimates of casualties, but it is hard to imagine that anyone survived. Not once during our helicopter flight did we see any Omani gunboats. However, just a few miles from the burning Erstig, we observed a Russian nuclear submarine of the Typhoon class. The Erstig has been fatally damaged and is sinking into the sea. The first casualty of the growing conflict in the Gulf of Oman. The big question here is, how will the world's two superpowers, now both committed to protecting their vital interests with military force, will react as they both sail into the Strait of Hormuz? This is Michael Boyle on the Nimitz. To answer that question, we're going to go live to Washington and Congressman Newt Gingrich and Senator Eugene McCarthy. Congressman Gingrich, is there anything that's worth blowing away the world, worth the risk of a nuclear confrontation that could be set off by the convergence of these two great naval task forces out there in the Middle East? Don, tragically, you've asked the right question. There is no thing worth nuclear war. But Winston Churchill said it brilliantly when he said that war is horrible, slavery is worse. If we stand by and allow the Soviet Union in international waters to block the United States from acting on behalf of our friends and allies with our friends and allies, if we stand by and allow a Soviet-backed puppet state in Oman to block the Straits of Hormuz and strangle both Japan, the second largest economy in the world, and Western Europe, then freedom will die. Congressman Gingrich, thanks very much. Now we've got Barry McKay in the CVN helicopter flying over New York City. Barry? Don, for the last few minutes we've been flying over expressways leading out of the city. The traffic, quite simply, it, it's barely moving. Seems to be growing worse by the hour. And we can only imagine what people are thinking. Perhaps New York City makes a very large target for some Russian missile. And that, because it is so big, it's a very hard place to run away from. The CBN News has just received these satellite pictures from San Francisco, where the traffic jams are bringing the city to a stop. Untold thousands are trying to escape to areas outside the city, driven, we assume, by a growing fear of the tensions in the world. Now we're going over to Senator Eugene McCarthy. Senator, millions of Americans tonight are frightened and people are evacuating cities. You look very calm. Are you frightened? Well, I don't know whether I'm frightened. I think the evacuation, I've always thought evacuation was a bad policy. First of all, it couldn't work because of our, our general traffic conditions, but uh, also psychologically bad. Uh, if, we, if we reach the point where you have to evacuate cities to avoid nuclear war, it means that there's no place to hide. Senator McCarthy, thank you very much. CBN News has learned that many schools closed early today and that they won't resume tomorrow. Evening activities of all kinds have been canceled. Instinctively, families, friends, loved ones are coming together. There's a growing sense of feeling of prudence and restraint that seems to be spreading across the country. Perhaps the only response we have to events we cannot control. All right, we're going now to Ann Gailmore in Carswell, Texas. The Strategic Air Command is redeploying its bombers, many to civilian airports. Their locations as yet unidentified. This strategy is designed to confuse Soviet intelligence and have the bombers dispersed as widely as possible throughout the country in case of nuclear attack. This is Ann Gilmore, CVN News, Carswell Air Force Base, Texas. The last time B-52s were redeployed was during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. To review developments of the last hour, at home, the Civil Aeronautics Board and the Federal Aviation Administration released a joint announcement suspending all overseas air travel 
until further notice. AT&T and regional telephone utilities have earned... Okay. Excuse me. You're crazy. Roman's gonna have your head. It's time to go, Dory. What are you talking about? I, uh... I just left the White House. There's a full-scale evacuation going on. You're not serious. I was there a half hour. An unarmed Dutch tanker was just blown out of the water. The president's pulled out all the stops. It's the military's ballgame now. They've got helicopters all over the White House along one hour, maybe two. They're going to take him out of there. I don't know where we're going to go. But we've got to get moving right now. I can't. Dory, one more broadcast isn't going to make any difference. It's too late for that now. Maybe. But I can't leave. I do love you. Downstairs. Come on, take a break. No, not yet. I can't get through to her. We'll bring Ernie in here, and then we'll fly her out. Civil Air not exported love that after he said all her flights were canceled. I can tell 10 million Americans what's going on in the world, and I can't get through to one woman. Maybe she already left. No, she knows that's what she's supposed to do, but I know her. She's at home watching me. That's what she's like. Stand by in the studio. We have a report coming in from Mick Boyle. Elements of the U.S. Navy's task force at the Strait of Hormuz have been involved in an exchange of gunfire with hostile warships. We received via satellite only moments ago this extraordinary coverage that you're about to see. The voice you hear is that of CVN reporter Michael Boyle aboard the Nimitz. I didn't think I'd see this. Omani gunboats engaged our ships in battle. What happened was this. Incredibly, an Omani gunboat met our lead frigate, the Talmadge, still several miles outside their territorial waters, and fired a shot across her bow. The Talmadge held course, and a second shot struck her in the hull. No word on casualties. The enemy fire was returned. A moment later, there was another explosion. It was the Omani gunboat. It must have taken a direct hit because it just disappeared. That naval action took place only moments ago. We're going to Washington now and CBN senior news correspondent Eric Severine. Eric, it's Don. Yes, sir. I'm remembering that even in the midst of gastric spasm at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was something inside me that kept insisting that once the players came to the edge of the abyss and looked into it, that they would pull back. And even today, as black as it seems, I still hear that insistent voice that says that reasonable people, once they've looked the devil in the face, aren't going to shake hands with him. What do you think? Well, without that <clears throat> constant hope, I guess the human race wouldn't have got this far, Don. But I can remember September 1st, 1939 in Paris. The week before, we would have said that. We couldn't believe it, but there it was. All the headlines, c'est la guerre. But maybe history's been trying to tell us something, that superpowers, great powers anyway, cannot go time and again to the brink without eventually going over it. This is the way World War I got started, not a sudden deliberate onslaught by one great power against another. I don't think any of the great powers in 1914 really wanted it, but it was a procession, a process, one event leading to the next event, to the next, all of it getting worse, and the leaders of the time did not have the will or the wisdom 
to intervene and stop that process. It could have been stopped. Many wars could have been stopped that way. And if the present leaders can't intervene in this situation and back up and stop it, then God will have to forgive them because there won't be anybody else around to do it. But what more do they need to know? They've, they've seen the mailed fist being shaken on either side. Surely they don't need any more demonstrations of macho superiority. I wouldn't think so. This is one government stalking another government, talking to another government. This is not the peoples of either country. The gunboat is gone and I have to presume sunk. But what's just a little bit eerie about all this is that out there somewhere, Russian subs are all around. Mick, we're staying with you. I wonder if you could hear that. That was a depth charge. That was number four. We started hearing them. The first one was about two minutes ago. Approximately five minutes ago, word came down that an unidentified submarine had slipped through our outer perimeter of picket ships and was being tracked on an interception course with this carrier. closer. They've got something targeted. The sense of expectation here is very, something you can almost taste. Al Horn, are you all right? Yeah, no damage. Just an incredible explosion from somewhere way over there. And then the police laid almost the same. Uh, my first thought was the ship. It looks to be low yield, but almost certainly a nuclear explosion. It seems to have been underwater. I don't know, maybe the Russian sub was getting too close and they hit it with a nuclear depth charge. Maybe it was the sub exploding, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to try to see what that was. Uh, this is my foil news on the Nimitz. Go on, let's go. Mick. Mick, we're staying with you. While we're waiting for Michael Boyle to return, I've been told that outside the United Nations in New York, several thousand demonstrators have surged through barricades. No, wait, we're still with the Nimitz. see the moon again over the Straits of Hormuz.
We, we seem to have lost contact with Michael Boyle aboard the aircraft carrier Nimitz. To repeat, it appears that in the Strait of Hormuz, U.S. and Soviet forces have exchanged nuclear weapons, with most likely the loss of an American warship and the destruction of a Soviet submarine. So, okay, where's Waldorf? He's on her way out to Edwards Air Force Base. The president is leaving the White House. She thinks he's going to his command aircraft. Jesus. We're going live now to Dorian Waldorf, standing by at Andrews Air Force Base. We are looking at the president's airborne command post. The idea is that if the nation's leaders are in an airplane five miles above the damage that would be caused by a nuclear attack on the United States, they will be able to continue to give vital orders to commanders on the ground. Dorian, I have to interrupt. We have word now that there's a message of some kind coming through from the White House. The President, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the President's closest advisors have left the White House. This is a precautionary measure. Its purpose is to make sure that the nation's leaders are able to continue to search for peaceful solutions to the grave problems that confront us. Now, within a few minutes, we will activate the emergency broadcast system where you will continue to receive information from your government. In the meantime, the President has instructed me to urge everyone during these critical hours to remain calm, to stay at home, and to offer their prayers for peace. Thank you. Twenty years ago, I used to spend a lot of time talking about hypothetical nuclear war scenarios with a man who was one of the pioneers in that form of prophecy. He's dead now. He really believed in his craft. He said to me once, Don, I'm convinced that sooner or later there will be a nuclear exchange. But I'm also convinced that when the leaders confront the terror of that exchange, they'll realize they can't get away any longer with playing war games, and they'll turn around. If there's anything to the power of prayer, in a short while, our voices will be replaced by official government voices of the emergency broadcasting system. Until that time, this is a news organization and we shall continue to serve you with the best reporting our facilities and staff can muster. Here is a bulletin that's just come in. The President's Emergency Airborne Command Post is now taking off from Andrews Air Force Base. Flying high over the United States, will join another airplane carrying members of the Strategic Air Command. They will attempt to maintain communications with United States forces throughout the world. The code name of this second airplane is Looking Glass. We interrupt this program. This is a national emergency. Important instructions will follow. This is an emergency action notification message. This station has interrupted its regular programming at the request of the White House to participate in the emergency broadcast system. During this emergency, most stations will remain on the air broadcasting news and official information to the public in assigned areas. This is the CVN News Network. We will remain on the air. You are listening to the emergency broadcasting system. <laughs> 